My name is Theodore Hensch, in English often called Ted Hensch. I am one of the directors, or now directors emeritus, at this Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics and the Division of Laser Spectroscopy. And at the same time, I am a professor at the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich. Spectroscopy is an old field. Uh, you look at the colors of light, and often they tell you something about matter, about the composition of matter. And laser spectroscopy uses lasers to make spectroscopy more sensitive, more powerful than uh, was possible in the old days. Yeah, <laughs> this is our hydrogen spectroscopy laboratory. What we see here is a vacuum chamber with a big cryo pump. And in here, hydrogen atoms escape from a helium-cooled nozzle, a fairly slow stream of hydrogen atoms, slow means 300 meters per second. The goal is <clears throat> to look at the simplest of the atoms, the hydrogen atom, this the highest precision and highest resolution that we can master uh, with a goal of comparing experimental data with theory. In the past, <coughs> tiny discrepancies between theory and experiment had led to major breakthroughs in fundamental understanding. We started in 1986. But uh, if you look at the old lab and the new one, we have very little uh, resemblance. After a while, we had reached a measurement position where it was no longer enough to measure the wavelengths of light, which is the traditional spectroscopic approach. But we had to learn how to count the frequency, how to count the wiggles of a light wave. And starting in 1997 or so, we put our faith in frequency cones. And uh, that's a very simple approach. We have a pulsed laser, a mode lock laser, that emits a regular train of femtosecond pulses. Uh, these pulses can be spectrally broadened, but it can consist of a million comb lines that are very sharp and very precisely evenly spaced. And then we have a device <clears throat> where the absolute frequency of every comb line is related to two radio frequencies uh, that we can measure very well in terms of atomic clocks. And your unknown frequency is now close to a particular comb line. You don't know which one yet, but uh, you can crudely measure the unknown frequency with a conventional uh, spectrometer to know, okay, it must be this comb line number uh, 569,112 or so. And then you see a beat note. Uh, the photo detector sees a beat note like you get between two f tuning forks. And uh, you can count that, and then you know what is the distance from this particular comb line, and since you know the absolute frequency of the comb line, you know the absolute frequency of your laser. But you don't need to worry about it anymore. Now it's user-friendly, and two of my students felt this is such a fantastic advance over anything that has been possible before. They were willing to, to found a company, and they are the world leader in frequency combs. This is the most precise measuring tool on Earth. It's a frequency comb that's developed in our spin-off company, uh, Mendler Systems. One can compare it to a clockwork. If you have a pendulum clock, you have something that oscillates the pendulum, maybe once per second or so, and it, the clockwork translates this oscillatory motion into the slow motion of the hand of the 
clock. An atom oscillates with something like 500,000 billion cycles per second. And what we know how to count with microwave instruments is a few billion. So we have a vector of 500,000 to bridge. And this is what the frequency code does. The first thing is to measure frequency, but if you measure frequency, you can also measure time. So you can make very precise clocks approaching 10 to the minus 19 relative uncertainty. Uh, so that means the gravitational redshift, that means if you lift a clock, it, it takes at a different rate. Uh, this can now be observed over millimeter scales. Uh, if I can measure times very accurately, I also can measure distances very precisely. Astronomers now <clears throat> are very interested in extrasolar planets, in planets around distant stars. And one very fruitful approach is to look at tiny shifts of spectral lines uh, due to, to the fact that a planet is orbiting around the star. The radial velocity method. And uh, so Menlo cones are now in use at some large observatories. There is another direction that we are pursuing now, and that is to use the many, many comb lines to look at complex spectra of molecules. Now, we are in the molecular spectroscopy lab of uh, Dr. Natalie Piquet, and uh, there are many things happening, but <clears throat> the goal is to have new types of spectrometers to identify and characterize molecules, to image molecules with potential many applications. And uh, one thing that will probably open many more opportunities is in the future is to put frequency combs on a chip so that they become very small, they run on low power. You can integrate several, two of them uh, on the same chip and you can think of entire spectrometers integrated on a small chip that might fit into a smartphone in the future. Each of these is a laser. <laughs> and of course they can in principle be mass produced so they can be inexpensive. They're sturdy, there's no alignment, you work with waveguides. In the future I think one can have the vision that you will have devices like this in a smartphone or in a small package that can analyze, for instance, the air in the refrigerator to tell you which food is overripe and what is missing in cheeses. For me, the main driver was my enthusiasm for inventions. Uh, I like to combine known things in new ways to create new tools that allow us sometimes to do what was impossible before. I like people who enjoy freedom, because when I was a student, I hated it if somebody told me what to do. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, like people who are self-motivated, who are, who are listening, whom one can uh, talk to, uh, but who, after a while, catch fire and run off by themselves. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> this is a gallery of people who obtains a doctorate here in our division, uh, starting in 1990. And if you look at it, uh, Andreas Hemmerich is a professor in Hamburg, Klaus Zimmermann in Tübingen, Ferdinand schmidt kala in Mainz, Martin Weitz in Bonn, Vladan Vulicic at MIT, uh, Markus Greine at Harvard University, Immanuel Bloch is director here. I've always attracted students with academic ambitions 
and uh, most of them have been very successful.